hello and welcome to my attempt at playing through a prototype game that was developed uh, about 6-12 months ago now, it's been quite a while, probably a bit longer now, everything seems shorter with lockdown. Um, but the, the premise behind this game was to prototype two particular novel means of interaction. The first is using the microphone uh, in order to make certain effects within the game world. We wanted the, set, the user to be able to use their voice to affect the game world, um, but also use certain aspects of brainwave activity, specifically brainwave activity related to stress or arousal levels in order to, again, affect certain aspects of the environment. Um, I won't talk through too much of that yet. We'll just jump straight into the game, play through a little bit of it, and then I'll kind of fill in some blanks as to what the process was and how these kind of novel means of interaction are actually being used. Messages. You have one new message and no saved messages. First saved message sent today at 14.47pm. Hello, it's me. Um, listen, I'm sorry, I'm running a little bit late. I don't think I'm going to be home tonight, but you should be okay. There's plenty of food in the fridge. The front door is locked. I've got the key for it, I'm afraid. If you do need to get out, you can get out perfectly easily through the garage. If you can remember the, the voice password, if you can't, I'm pretty sure I left it on the front page of my notebook, uh, which is in the safe. Um, so yeah, you should be able to get that in case of emergency. Anyway, hope you have a nice evening. Bye bye. So a couple of things just to very quickly talk about in terms of that opening sequence. Um, obviously with these sort of games, whenever there's any kind of novel interaction, it becomes extremely important to have some sort of kind of instruction. Ideally, that instruction wants to be what we would call kind of integrated instruction. It's something which you experience during the game rather than something you'd have to read in a readme file or anything like that. But obviously anything which is using any kind of novel interaction, you need to try and make that accessible as possible the minute you add these kind of new features that people are very, uh, that are new to a lot of people, they are going to struggle with them. You need to make it as clear as possible, but also you need to get that information across efficiently. So that's what that integrated instruction tried to tried to achieve. Now, just a couple of things in terms of uh, kind of what you can see basically kind of around you. The, the emphasis on these types of projects which we work on and the same kind of projects that would be encouraging you to do um, is proof of concept. You know, it's taking something novel and trying to develop a particular idea. It's not about making, um, you know, a AAA experience, and it's particularly not about making something from from scratch. So, any existing assets that you can bring together in a coherent sense, that are absolutely fine. There's no problem with that at all. So, um, some of you may even already recognise this particular um, kind of room simply from an existing asset pack. The entire house. Um, is lifted from an asset pack. The positioning of all of these um, pieces of furniture that you can see, the television and so on, is all taken from one place. The the video of the um, the, the jellyfish is taken from a separate place, and there is this wonderful plugin um, which I was able to get and was at one point freely available on the Epic Game Store, which does this wonderful little reflection effect. That's lovely. Okay, we we love that. That's very nice indeed. Okay, so just wandering around the house. There's just one thing before I actually kind of start the game proper to kind of draw your attention to, which is the, the, the biometric um, interface. We'll get to the microphone in a little while. But with the biometric interface, which I am actually currently wearing, obviously it's not possible for me to kind of on command um, uh, come across as you know stressed or unstressed. It may come, it may just turn on and off uh, kind of seemingly at random when I'm first starting the game. Obviously the idea is as the game develops and the, the environment kind of ramps up the stress levels, you would find that most players would, would respond to that. Obviously, if I designed the game, it's a little bit it's a little bit different. It's difficult to be scared by your own game. So what I've done is just kind of attach, um, it's, it's shortcut basically the, the stress and non-stress threshold um, to the Z and X keys. So if I just press Z, then I can simulate that particular effect. I have a turn X, I can turn it off. Um, the, the, the principle was basically very simple. Whenever you're, you're not stressed, when you walk around certain areas of the environment, um, more or less nothing happens. 
um, when you are stressed, you're basically a little bit clumsy. So if I turn Z on, as you notice when I walked into the room, nothing happened there. But whilst I'm stressed, I'm clumsy. Oh dear, I've knocked that over. And when you're clumsy, you knock things over, that makes sound, and that's all about alerting your uh, your presence, oh, sorry, alerting the, the AI to your presence, which, which we will get to in a second. So let's just follow the hints and see what we're supposed to be doing now. In development and testing, we found that having some sort of hint menu which was optional was very preferable. You didn't want something which was just constantly telling you what to do um, straight away, but if someone was lingering for too long in a particular space, then a hint menu usually prompted them to move into the move on to the next kind of point of play, but giving them the additional option of just being able to, to press H whenever they need to access it just in case they missed that first hint when it came up automatically was, was always very helpful. So it's telling me to go to the living room, so I'll do that now. And the idea with this here is to try and use kind of sound to draw attention. Obviously the, there's only a small visual change when this message comes up to tell you what to do next. So it was really important that we were able to use something to, to grab the player's attention and make them look in that particular direction. So having the sound make that little beep um, we found very effective and most players when they walked past that the minute they heard it they instinctively swung to the right and saw this screen. So they were then given the next instruction of what they needed to do. Now once we actually get to the point where I'm summoning the um, the creature, should we say, um, the problem that we have is that it responds to my voice and obviously I'm using my voice to explain kind of what's happening at the same time. So the challenge that I'm going to have is being able to somehow continue to play this game effectively whilst still talking to you because whenever I raise my voice it will hear me um, and it will come basically it will come to find me but we will we'll carry on playing and we'll see how we manage to, to get on with that. So let's just follow the instruction for the time being. Summoned. Okay, I believe if I talk quietly enough, it won't hear me. sure it's heard me and is now basically tracking me so whilst I basically run around in circles with it chasing me it's got a relatively simple AI system behind it basically anything which appears in its uh, immediate forward vision it will see and it will chase for a certain period of time if you get too close to it in general even behind it it will still sense you so you just can't get too close in any circumstance um, if you're basically if whilst I'm talking if my decibel level reaches a certain threshold then it hears me and it will basically track um, and just keep following. But what I can do, and this is the trick, um, is to actually use my voice as a way to mislead it. So if I make a lot of noise, it will move to that particular point where I was when I made that noise. So I can basically make noise, get it to follow me, then stay quiet if I can, and move on to the next place. And it will buy me some time to do whatever it is that I need to do next, which in this case is go upstairs. I don't think I'm going to get away with this. 
Okay, so if I start it again, and we'll have another quick playthrough. Messages. You. Uh, you notice I was able to, to skip that immediately. One of the tricks which we found was, was worth doing when um, we did the initial testing for this prototype was that it was really important that we wanted people to engage with that tutorial at first because it gave very important information about how to actually interact with the game and if users didn't actually read that they struggled to figure out what on earth they were supposed to be doing and how they were supposed to use the additional hardware but at the same time we found that if the minute you gave um, the user the ability to skip a tutorial particularly a text-based tutorial they immediately took that opportunity. Even if it was the first time they played the game, they streamed, oh, it's a tutorial, we'll skip it, I'll figure it out. But then they didn't figure it out and they would struggle. So what we found was that it was worth making that unskippable, but ideally, I think what we've got here actually could be more nuanced than just having what we've got, which is a, a hidden key that the user could press after the first playthrough in order to skip through. That's just a kind of a quick fix, really. Ideally, there needs to be a kind of a more persistent-based Kind of a level based system which means on you know on the first playthrough it will always play that and then on the second and then subsequent playthroughs there's in that instance the ability to skip it um, rather than making it automatically only available on the first playthrough because in, in that instance there, there were again there were plenty of play testers who just didn't pick up all the information on the first the first run they missed some of the text or they didn't interpret it correctly so giving players after the first run through the ability to quit, sorry, to, to skip past it, I think is the is the best way forward for that sort of instruction. So just to make things a little bit more interesting, I will I will play with the uh, the stress level permanently on after I've actually summoned the creature, just to make it, although obviously I didn't complete it the first run through even without that on, but we'll, we'll give it a go. Now, one thing you'll you, you might kind of spot is that the the code is accessible right from the beginning of the game, um, and that means kind of on multiple playthroughs that you always know. You know, once you've played through it once and you have found that safe code location, you know where it is. So theoretically, you can do what I've literally just done there: observe that code and then take it um, basically kind of upstairs. So you don't need to summon the creature, come downstairs, find the code, and go back up again. Um, I did kind of experiment with a couple of different ideas one thing which which does change the the four code is randomly generated but that's at the start of the level what's not changed is the position of it um, it did kind of occur to me in later testing that it might be worth randomly positioning the actual code around the map but that wasn't implemented uh, at, at this stage but at least the, the the code is new so you can't just memorize the code and take it from one playthrough to the next but I can try and remember it now 8145 and then take it straight upstairs. Summoned. I'm over here, creature. itself is basically um, just kind of follows a really basic uh, patrolling 
system where it will cycle between a couple of different preset patrols. For the most point, there are various waypoints scattered around the house that it will just move randomly in between. There's a little bit of nuancing where it won't go through certain ones again and again and again. But for the most part, it's basically once you've got to waypoint A, you'll randomly select between the others, move to the other one, and so on. That's unless, obviously, either it sees you or it hears you. Or you knock something over. Messages. You... Okay, so let's let's have one more go. Try and remember that. I was smart enough to at least make it so you couldn't enter the code until you got some of the creature. And I've forgotten the code already. Down, back, down I go. There we go. Summoned. Notice I didn't speak loud enough there. Oh, there we go. Call me. Over here. Okay, let me out. See, this is one of my favourite sections with the garage door moving so slow, and obviously to open the garage door you have to make noise which attracts the creature, so you end up with a tense moment of hoping it doesn't catch you in time. One thing which you kind of might have spotted um, kind of throughout that was that the actual words that the game was telling me I needed to say in order to do the voice activation um, weren't actually necessary. And if you did notice that, well spotted. Um, there are absolutely certain mechanisms which you can use. There is uh, the Google API uh, voice recognition or uh, uh, speech detection framework, which integrates really nicely into Unreal Engine 4 that you can use. Um, but we've not got running in this particular version of it. We just, we just kind of simulated the effect or kind of faked the effect in this particular instance. Um, but that kind of system is very straightforward to implement as long as you've got all the API stuff kind of taken care of. And that will enable you to uh, kind of require the user to say very specific passphrases in order to open doors. But the key aspect that we were interested in here was absolutely just that that vocal threshold. So you could speak quietly, but the closer the, the the creature got to you, the more quietly you needed to be, the more quiet you needed to be, sorry, before it would hear you and it would track you. Um, hopefully this has given you kind of just a couple of useful tips um, on using certain, uh, what we would call innovative, um, whether it is innovative, I will leave you, leave you to be the judge of that, but innovative types of interaction mechanics integrated into, you know, obviously a very traditional game design. But hopefully this will also give you kind of a sense of kind of the scope for certain projects. Now I've kind of used the Royal Wii when I describe the, the process of building this. Now I had some support in the, the testing process, but largely speaking, the development was literally just me. So it was a single developer project done part-time over roughly kind of 
two and a half months, so about 10 weeks. Now, I probably put in a little bit more time than would probably be expected within a 20 credit unit, but I think roughly speaking, um, the amount of time that I kind of spent was only a wee bit over kind of what I would say would be the expected amount for you to actually use um, for your development projects, be they you know single developer, 20 credit unit type assessments. So hopefully this might give you a sense of the type, both the type of project, but also kind of the level of depth um, and refinement. So this did go through a few iterative testing stages to, to refine it, the hint system, the way that the AI works, the difficulty, the um, kind of the ranges of it being able to, the AI being able to see you and the thresholds of it being able to respond to you. All of those were, were nuanced and refined over time with play testing because on the initial run through, it, everything worked fundamentally, but it wasn't a very positive player experience because the, the, the nuance, the, the finer points um, of the, the system, particularly the AI and its sensitivity to the player, uh, either made it far too easy or made it far too difficult. So in terms of getting the challenge right, there was definitely a requirement for uh, a good few rounds of player testing. Nothing too significant, but probably about, I think it went through four iterations in total. Um, with only minor tweaks each time, so I think those four iterations took about a week and a half, two weeks worth of testing and development, testing and development, um, and then that was it, that was done. So it's kind of eight weeks for the first build, and then two weeks for testing and refinement was, was the broad process that was gone through. Anyway, I hope this has been remotely useful um, for, for anyone who's watching. And it might give you some inspiration for the kind of project that you might be able to use, the kind of kind of novel interactions that you might be able to use for, for this type of project. Um, and gives you, again, like I say, a sense of maybe the, the, the scale um, of the type of project that you would need to do for this kind of assessment. Thanks very much for watching.